Well, good morning uh, and welcome to Christ Church. I'm Pastor Ryan. This is my wife, Jackie. Um, and we are excited to welcome you into our home again this Sunday. Um, to our friends and family in Christ Church that we don't get to see every week, I think we just like to say we miss you um, and are praying for you and thinking of you often. And so just know that our hearts are very much with you today. Um, and if you're just joining us uh, for the first time today, um, I'll be honest, I think I'm coming into our service today with a heavy heart, with a lot of grief today. Um, this past week, I've heard about uh, the state of things in um, many of our seniors' homes throughout the island, uh, being kind of stuck in there, unable to um, to move out, like to get out and get fresh air and, and just do normal life things um, is incredibly challenging. And so I'm grieving with you. I have many friends uh, people of color throughout Canada who are in deep grief right now um, as they are processing all that's taking place in the States and in Canada. Um, and we're, we're filming this ahead of time, so it's not Sunday right now for us, but uh, tomorrow I'll be participating in the Nanaimo rally uh, for Black Lives Matter and, um, and, and just seeking justice and change in our nation and throughout North America. And so all of this is taking place under the banner of, banner of COVID. And so uh, I'll be honest, there's a real heaviness to my heart. Uh, my, my mind gets quite overwhelmed through these days as we're taking in all of this information and trying to understand it and weigh it and determine what it looks like for us to act and to do what's right and what's needed and how to walk our kids through this. And so however you're coming in today, uh, we, we, we wanna welcome you to, do, to join us in going to Jesus. Um, so what we're going to be doing from here is, um, is, is going to Jesus himself and receiving from him exactly what we need most. And what we know of Jesus is that he grieves with the grieving. So he meets us where we're at. Um, that he suffers with us and for us in order to save us from our suffering. Uh, save us in the midst of our hardship and pain and sorrow. That he wants to give us new life and new strength in his resurrection. Um, and he wants to, to call us into his great purpose in the world. Um, to, to better the world, to serve it, to redeem it. And so wherever you're at today, we want to invite you to come and to be a part of that with us. And as we feel that, as we feel our hearts, we're going to use the colic of purity today to do that, to take our heart and to give it to the one who knows it perfectly, can care for it perfectly. There's no perfect solution for things right now, it seems, right? But the best thing we can do is give our heart to the one who can handle whatever we're going through. So let's do the call of purity together today to turn away from certain things and towards the one who can care for us. Let's do that together. Almighty God, to, to whom, whom all hearts, hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The other aspect of, of what we're going through is just not knowing what the good thing to do is. Like, what's the right thing I should do? And so what we're doing now is recommitting our lives to the good way of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We're going to follow his way and that we can trust that his way is actually the best thing we can do mm -hmm. in whatever situation that we find ourselves in in this coming week. Our Lord Jesus Christ says this. The first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord, 
And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us and write both these your laws in our hearts, we beseech you. And just before we enter into a time of worship, um, of proclaiming God as good, as we proclaim him in worship, let's just turn together to Psalm 37. I'm going to start at uh, verse 1. It says, Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evil doers sh shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked, wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in the abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend their bow to bring down the poor and needy, to slay those whose way is upright. Their sword shall enter his, their own heart and their bow shall be broken. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the day of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. They are not put to shame in evil times. In the days of famine, they have abundance. So as we turn our hearts to worship now, See God as he rightly is, the only one that can bring about salvation, the only one who can bring about justice, that to worship now is to look to the solution, is to look to our true hope, is to look to our answer to all of the world's problems, and so to give him glory and honor and our affections is to bring about justice upon the earth for the poor, for the broken, and for the exploited. And so Heavenly Father, saving Son, and comforting Holy Spirit, we worship you now in heart, soul, mind, and body. The love of God is greater far than tongue open can ever tell it goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell the guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win his erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin oh love of god how rich and pure how measureless and strong shall forevermore endure the saints and angels when years of time shall
shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills mountains call God's love so sure still still on measureless and strong redeeming grace for Adam's race the saints and angels oh love of God so rich and pure so measureless and strong Shall forevermore endure the saints in Forevermore do we within the oceans fill and were the skies of parchment made. For every stalk on earth the quill and every man scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry nor could the scroll contain no stretch from sky to sky. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and days. How measureless and strong it shall forevermore endure the saints' name.
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine how great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of angels stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross is spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my name. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe And out of the silence a roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me Declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus, yours is the Hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Sing hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope Jesus Christ, my living hope salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living Lord you are, you are, you are, you are the hope inside of me the hope inside of me oh you walk into the room everything changes the darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you let's sing that again when you walk into the room, everything changes. And darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more. Just sit here at your feet and worship. We worship you, oh Lord. 
sing we love you we love you we'll never stop we can't live without you jesus we love you and we can't get enough on this is for you when you walk into the room sickness starts to vanish and every hopeless situation ceases to exist and when you walk into the room dead begin to rise cause there is resurrection life in all you do we love you you'll never stop we can't live without you Jesus we love you and we can't get enough So, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your presence. We thank you that you dwell in the praises of your people. And, Lord, as we lift your voice up, you are near to us and with us and gathered amongst us that you have come to be with your people as we worship you. And so, Lord, in the midst of your presence now, we pray this prayer together in this time of great turmoil and great hardship, we offer this prayer in one heart and one mind. Almighty God, you created us in your own image. 
grant us grace to condemn fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression and help us to use our freedom rightly in the establishment of justice in our communities and among the nations to the glory of your holy name through jesus christ our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever amen amen well we're going to do our gospel reading now um, for today and so we're going to take that uh, from the book of matthew um, we are going to return there for our studies um, uh, through the, the Gospel of St. Matthew. And we're going to begin in verse 1 and read through to verse 12, which is going to be a bit of a review for us to catch us up on where we left off. Mm -hmm. So beginning in verse 1. In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now, the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to thee, Lord Christ. Well, now we will give our confession of faith, um, and we will recite the Apostles' Creed together. Um, that has been the uh, tradition of the church for 2,000 years to remember the gospel, to recommit to the gospel, and trust that this will be sufficient for us in the weeks to come. So let's do this together. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, and the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to pick up our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we were doing this study last year uh, before COVID and everything else that hit. And so we're going to pick that up again. And we're in uh, Matthew chapter 3, near the end of uh, this section here on John the Baptist. And in the coming weeks, we're going to be looking at the baptism of Jesus and the significance that that holds for us. But before we do that, I thought it would be helpful to do a bit of a review of what we've covered in the Gospel of Matthew to kind of catch us up. And I think that we're going to see themes within it that are incredibly helpful for what 
uh, to give us perspective of what's going on in the world today and how the way of Jesus uh, not only applies to it, uh, but helps us understand our role in the midst of it. Now, when we look back through the first three chapters of Matthew, we see that the story that Matthew is telling about Jesus um, is all about this king, this promised king of Israel that is coming and that now has arrived. And so he begins in chapter one with a genealogy of Jesus. And basically what that does for us is provides um, showing a line that goes all the way back um, all throughout the Old Testament scriptures, but its main purpose is to show that the same Messiah that was promised to Abraham back in Genesis and subsequently all through the generations and then is promised again to King David that a, uh, a king will come from his royal lineage and that that king will come and not only be king of Israel, but will be king for the whole world. And that through him will come salvation to all peoples. And so Jesus is that king. And so Matthew chronicles the genealogy of Jesus, stretching all through the Old Testament to show that Jesus is a legitimate heir to David and to Abraham. And so not only is he this messianic king that is coming to the world, but also he's a specific kind of king. And the kind of king that Jesus is, is one in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed. That Jesus is not just this high and mighty king, but he's also a humble king that lays um, that lays claim in his genealogy to all sorts and kinds of people. That Jesus isn't just saying, look at my flawless royal lineage, but that Jesus is also saying, look at all of the mess in my family line. That I'm not only laying claim to the throne, I'm laying claim to the thorns that are throughout the whole thing. That I'm not just the king who is this mighty rose at the end of this great lineage stretching throughout generations. But in the, with this rose is all of these thorns, these points of great pain and sorrow and calamity. And throughout it, so we have, we have incest, we have rape, uh, we have prostitution, we have corruption of power and abuse of power. We have good kings, but also really evil kings who are corrupt, who, who commit sins of child sacrifice and, and uh, pagan rituals and religion and all of this stuff. Like Jesus's family line is a colossal mess of sinfulness and brokenness and family pain. So this king is not only laying claim to the throne, he's also laying claim to all of humanity's brokenness, sinfulness, and pain. So Jesus's backstory is full of all of this. Next, Matthew details for us the conception of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, that he looks at the fact that Jesus is both God in, come in flesh to save the world, but this Savior is going to come and be entrusted to teen unmarried parents. And so with that is going to come all sorts of shame and misunderstanding, and that he is actually going to live a life starting from the very beginning that many of us have lived, that come from these these really broken backstories. And then the birth of Jesus taking place in Bethlehem in a stable shows that he's not only in solidarity with those who have broken paths and broken stories and shameful upbringings, but also the impoverished, born in dire straits. The next thing that Matthew covers is that Jesus has to run from abusive authority 
King Herod at the time, seeks to kill Jesus because of his royal lineage and claim to the throne. And because of that, he massacres a whole town's worth, a whole region worth of children within the same age of Jesus, trying to destroy this potential threat to his throne. And so you can see right away that the good news of Jesus has political implications. When kings fear babies, you know that there is major political impact coming. So because Herod seeks to destroy Jesus as a child, Jesus is forced to flee to Egypt with his young parents, Mary and Joseph, and to hide out. So Jesus is an exile. Jesus is um, an immigrant in a foreign country fleeing abusive power in his home in his home nation and so he not only has a broken family line he not only has a backstory riddled with all sorts of of shame and um and lowliness and poverty and abuse but then jesus moves back uh into uh, out of Egypt and comes to this place called Nazareth. And so Jesus actually is known throughout history as Jesus the Nazarene. Now, taking on the name Nazarene is literally to take on himself a title of being despised and insignificant. Philip in the New Testament scripture says, can anything good come from Nazareth? It's a, it's a, a hole, hole in the wall kind of city, like insignificant, outside of any real political power or influence within Rome or within Israel. And so Jesus is known as being part of this. And Matthew is stacking up a story here to say Jesus is the legitimate king, but this king is in a deep and intentional and ingrained solidarity with the poor, the broken, the insignificant of the world. That's saying a lot about the character of Jesus. Now, when we get to chapter 3, we are introduced to this prophet character named John the Baptist. And John is preaching and proclaiming that Jesus has come, that the Messiah is here, and with the Messiah comes God's kingdom. So the average person hearing about John's message, that the kingdom of God is at hand, they like this message, okay? And we don't tend to think this way, um, but it's important for us to recognize that the response that John gets in these times here is that it says that all of Judea and that region come out to John's message in the wilderness. They love this message because for the average person, the idea that God's good and perfect nation is here and is available is good news because they are stuck under an oppressive government in Rome. And Rome sucks. Rome is not fun for them. They are not um, a people of privilege under Roman rule. And so they're excited about the idea that God's messianic kingdom is finally here and is finally coming. So they flock to John's message. They leave their jobs, their cities, they set everything aside, and a revolution is starting just by going to hear John's message in the wilderness. Now, John's message is not only that the kingdom of God is here, but also that the way to prepare to receive that kingdom and to enter into that kingdom is through repentance. And this is important because the idea here is that a, a recognition has to happen in the people that they've been participating in what's wrong in the world. That what's wrong in the world is wrong in me. So they love the idea of God's kingdom coming because they see so much corruption and oppression and lack of representation. And nobody cares for them in power. So they want God's kingdom. They're stoked that God's kingdom is available. 
But the way you enter into that kingdom is to recognize that life in this world under these under these fallen, corrupt powers has also corrupted us. That we are sinful, that we are corrupted, that we exploit those who are under us, that we participate in this system that dehumanizes people, that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and there's been times where we've eaten other dogs to survive. So there's a recognition that takes place in the people to go, we want God's kingdom, this worldly kingdom sucks. But I recognize that I have also participated in it, that I put my hopes in it at times, that I've been part of this system, and I need to be cleansed from it in order to be ready for God's Messiah King to come. And the way that they express that is by being ceremonially washed in John's baptism. So it's this, it's literally just, and you've all seen it in movies. If, it, if you're not from the church and not used to this, it's this being baptized into the water, which is meant to be a washing and a cleansing of sin and, and a preparedness to receive the new good way that's coming. And people are stoked on this. They're ready to be washed of this corrosive, destructive way of living. And they want a good kingdom and a good way and a righteous way and a just way. And they want to be a part of that. They want to be good in it. So they get baptized. But all of this attention starts to get the attention of the, the political and religious leaders of the times. So we know those as Pharisees and Sadducees. And so these political and religious leaders, because it was a mix of roles, come in and they're very skeptical of John's message. They're skeptical because they're in bed with the political system. Yes, they hate Rome, and yes, they think Rome sucks, and they don't want to be under Roman rule, but they've also made compromises and agreements with the Roman system that they would be able to say it's working for us. They know it's bad, but they found ways to benefit in the midst of it. And so they've garnered wealth and influence and, and, and have roles of power in the midst of it, and especially they're in relation to a figure called Herod. Now, this is King Herod. This is a different Herod from the Herod that we heard about that tried to kill uh, the child Jesus, and now this is an heir to that Herod, a son of Herod. And so he is he's a bad man. Like, he's a full-blown, corrupt terrible abuse of power in every possible way you could think of. And his private life, his family life is full of like debauchery and, you know, weird sex stuff in terms of like him being attracted to his brother's wife and, and, da and niece and all of this stuff. And so he's this creepy wealthy guy who is, you know, uh, narcissistically, addicted to power and so he's full-blown terrible in every way okay and so um he does all sorts of bad things but the pharisees and the sadducees kind of remain quiet on his faults and his issues because they have some political agreements with herod in which he supports their plays and and their plans for society in which they have power and influence. So he funds and builds a new temple. And who's in charge of the temple? Well, these guys are, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees especially um, make up the majority share of the temple council that rules over the people's spiritual lives. And so when Herod builds a big new temple that all the people come to worship at, who has all the power and the influence? Well, the Sadducees and the Pharisees do. And so because of this, um, Herod kind of represents their positions to Rome. And so by being married to him, 
they have influence within Rome and, they, and they're not in constant states of war with the Roman government. And so what they'll do is they'll turn, to blind, they'll turn a blind eye to Herod's injustices in order to cash in on his political um, power throughout the region. So when John comes proclaiming a better kingdom than this, a better way than this, a more just nation that is to be received through repentance, they recognize that, that John's message is a threat to their system of power. That they've, they've, they can't receive the good news of the kingdom without also a repentance for their political loyalties. That if they're going to get on board with the new king and the new kingdom, they recognize that they can't continue in their way of uh, the system that they've developed with Herod and with Rome. And so John is calling them to abandon their political affiliations to publicly repent of their misplaced hope and trust, and then most of all to face the fact that they have been participating in this injustice. That's a big deal. So no wonder these Pharisees and Sadducees come skeptical. They're not actually super stoked on the idea of repentance. They're not super stoked on the idea of a coming messianic king because it's a threat to them because of who they're united to. And who they're united to is a system of oppression. So when they come out in verse 7 of chapter 3, John addresses them as the political opponents of Jesus that they are. And he calls them, you brood of vipers essentially implying that their power and influence is poisonous to everyone underneath them. So why is John so strong and so harsh with them and so, um, you know, full of conflict? It's because John serves the true king. John's loyalty is singular. Right? Wealth and power and influence means nothing to a guy that lives in the desert, lives on wild honey, eats locusts, and wears camel hair clothing. Think of a camel and think of clothing made out of that camel. How's that going to feel? That's pretty stinking uncomfortable all of the time. So this guy has no trappings in the wealth and power of the world. He has a singular loyalty, and that is to the new king, the rightful king, the King Jesus. And so when John speaks about Jesus, he, he, he talks of him like this, that he is mightier than I. The Pharisees and the Sadducees are all about getting in on the power. John is all about getting out because he wants Jesus solely to be in power because Jesus is good. Jesus' character is pure. Jesus is going to fight for the poor, the broken, and the exploited. So John recognizes the one that's coming is mightier than I, and that's good news because I don't want the power. I want him to have the power because he's that good. Whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. That's how much he respects the Messiah. The coming king is that he goes, I don't even deserve to hold his sandals. He's that good. So he knows his king Jesus is coming and he is coming to right what is wrong in the world. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not just participants in the corruption that's taking place in Rome and with Herod, but they're actually something worse. They're worse than Rome and worse than Herod because their corruption and oppression that they're participating in co-ops God's holy word and God's holy law 
and God's spirituality of relating with his people. So what makes the Pharisees and Sadducees so much worse than even Herod is the fact that they're taking God's words and they're using God's name to do hurtful, oppressive, terrible things. They're saying, in the name of this, I'm going to be violent and we're going to exploit you and we're going to take your money and we're going to make it difficult for you to relate to God and we're going to hurt your relationship with God and we're going to make you think low of yourself and, and hate yourself and think that God wants nothing to do with you. He only wants to do with us because we're the cream of the crop. We're the elites. We're the children of Abraham. And so here they are. They are they're wrong in all the worst ways. And so when Jesus comes, Jesus is coming to bring two very important pieces. And this is John's message at the verses that we're going to look at today. Is that the king is coming to bring justice. And his justice is twofold. The first part, John says that he will come and baptize in the Holy Spirit. That the first part of Jesus' justice is he is going to bring reparation. By that meaning, Jesus is going to repair what's broken in the exploited and oppressed and the poor and the broken of the world. Jesus is going to immerse them in his very spirit of love. So the very essence of of God's being, his heart of heart, the overflow of his generosity and love and heart for redemption for the world and passion for restoration. He is going to immerse the poor and the broken of the world in this spirit. He's going to cover them in it. John baptized them with water and for repentance, but Jesus is going to overwhelm them with God's presence and goodness and nature and character and love and goodness and all of that poured out and over and into the poor and the broken is going to bring them back to life. It's going to restore all the places that have been lost, all the things that have been stolen, all the brokenness and despair and the heartache and how it breaks the mind and breaks the body, Jesus is going to come in the power of the Holy Spirit and he's going to restore people in their hearts. He's going to restore their minds and he's going to restore their bodies and he's going to offer them a nation and a kingdom that is better than we could have ever hoped for or imagined. This is what Jesus brings for the poor. Everything that's been lost, everything that's been stolen, everything that's been broken, all the being spoken down to and, and belittled and dehumanized and rejected and shamed and guilted, all of that Jesus is going to make right. So for poor people, for broken people, for desperate people, for belittled and forgotten and insignificant people, Jesus is great news. Amen? Now, for those who are the oppressors, for those who are abusing their power, for those who treat the lowly and the broken as disgusting and disposable and expendable and forgettable for all of them Jesus's Holy Spirit is going to bring something different for the poor and the broken he'll baptize them in his goodness for the oppressors he brings fire that's the picture that John brings he'll baptize the poor in his spirit and he will he will pour down an unquenchable fire upon the unjust. The same Holy Spirit that saves the poor of spirit will destroy and consume the oppressor. So when John speaks to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's a warning. Verse 12 is this. 
the conquering messianic king that is coming for the poor and the broken and the oppressed, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The analogy that John gives to describe the ministry of Jesus is this. In ancient times, they would create a kind of stone cube, a, a half wall, if you can imagine kind of a footing, right? It might come three feet off the ground. And then they would pile all their wheat into the center of that little holding uh, space. And in it is the stalk and the chaff and everything's all in one place. And what they would do is they break it all up and then to separate the wheat, which is the good part that we would use for grain, uh, for flour, for bread, for all of these things, needs to be separated from the chaff, which is like the husk and, and the outer stuff that would just be um, discarded. What they would do is they'd take the fork and plunge it in. And on a windy day, they would throw it up into the air. And what would happen is the, the part of value the true essence worth all of this hard labor and work would come down because the wheat was heavier, it would fall to the ground. And then the chaff would be taken by the wind and it would be blown outside of the threshing floor. And at the end of the day, all the grain would be collected and milled and used for food and sustenance. Think of how many times Jesus calls himself the bread of life. Right? Bread brings life. But all the chaff would be raked together and then shoveled and burned, discarded, not worth keeping. The picture here is that very thing. All of the cries of the oppressed and the broken throughout the ages, Jesus is now coming to bring justice for them. And the way it happens is actually the way that John starts his ministry and Jesus continues, is all those who humble themselves, like the grain, fall to the ground before the king. All those who repent, who let go of loftiness, who let go of power and let go of might and strength, but instead see their need for a savior king and fall to the ground on their knees and receive the king will be saved. But all those who cling to power and cling to authority and cling to control and fight against the coming Messiah and continue systems of injustice and and dehumanization of the seemingly insignificant of the world, which is the 99%, Jesus deals with them harshly. And the warning for the Pharisees and the Sadducees is, the king is coming and this is your chance to repent, to turn and receive him. And there is no mix. You can't try and hold on to your power and your authority and your self-assurance and your political parties and your ideals and your loyalties and say you still believe in Jesus the Messiah. You can't do both because Jesus is the only one who is mighty enough and good enough and worthy enough to hold all authority. And so you can tell the people of Jesus, of the good king, are always the lowly ones. They're the poor, the broken, the oppressed, the repentant, the sorry, the self-aware. They're not the high and the mighty claiming that the system should continue, that the oppression is necessary, that the poor deserve what they are getting, only the corrupt say the poor deserve what they are getting. Jesus never says that. Jesus always comes to the poor and always comes to the lowly and always joins arms with them in solidarity to say, if you suffer, I suffer. Your cause is my cause. Your wrong is what I will make right. He never stands with the powerful and says they deserve what they are getting. Ever. And to say that with this book, 
to say that in the name of Jesus is a desperately dark evil. And it breaks my heart to see it used in that way. The way of Jesus is always for the lowly, always for the broken, always for the exploited, and never for those who sit in places of power, consumed with their own greed and wealth and comfort and self-service. So John's message for us, if I was to put anything before us today, it would be this. Those who receive the true King Jesus, hear the message of John and go, I will get low so Jesus can take the throne. The followers of Jesus always say, I am poor, broken, sinful, and in need of salvation. What's wrong in the world is wrong in me. Save me first. I'll trust you, Jesus. We don't want to find ourselves because of loyalty to political parties and political motions and political ideals and political leaders ever opposing the cries of the poor and the broken. We never want to fight for the system when the system is hurting people made in God's image, ever. And the scriptures, if they are clear on anything, are clear on that. The way of Jesus is always for the poor, for the broken, and for the seemingly insignificant like us. We never want to think we should be in control and in power and in charge of the system. We should never fight for the system. Because our loyalty is to the king. Our loyalty and our hope is to the new kingdom, not to worldly ones. And our our, our wealth, our portion, our comfort comes in our baptism of the Holy Spirit, not in our control of earthly things. Our inheritance is the presence of God. It's not the systems of this earth. And so we're quick to let go of wealth. We're quick to let go of, of plans and power and seats of authority because what we want is the true king. What we want is the good kingdom. And what we need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I do believe that these scriptures are a prophetic word for these times. And I believe that Christ's church makes most sense following the way of Jesus and not in allegiance to Herod and not in, a, in hope to Rome and not looking for comfort in this world, but enjoying the life that is available in the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives. So I would ask now that we would take some time for private confession. You have heard John's message today. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Is your heart ready to get low in repentance for what is wrong in the world and our participation in it and ready to put hope and faith in the person and work of Jesus, our true King and his good kingdom. Would you take time now for private confession? Now let's do general confession together. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, 
Forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Now hear God's response to our prayers. Our almighty God and our heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins. To all those who with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to him, has mercy on you. He pardons and delivers you from all your sins, from all your agreements with these broken worldly systems, for all your participation in them, knowing and unknowing. And he confirms and strengthens you in all goodness and brings you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, pours out his goodness and his grace upon you to fill you, to consume you, to redeem you, and to change you. You're born again into his kingdom, a new citizenship, a new purpose, and a new way. Receive this way by faith. Trust that Jesus is good enough to accomplish this work for you. Amen. Now, let's just take that, the Holy Spirit, and as it says in Scripture, you know, it says, we love because he first loved us. And just as we are proclaiming and thanking him and receiving absolution, we feel his love. Let your heart feel his love and turn that love. It's an abundant love. It's never lacking. It's never one that we need to be stingy with. Mm -hmm. The more we pull down, the more we have to offer. And so let's pour that out through our intercessions today by his spirit that it would be powerful and move in our world. So we pray for God's grace. Lord, receive our praise and, and hear, hear our prayers. prayers. Lord God, through your grace, we are your people. Through your Son, you have redeemed us. In your Spirit, you have made us your own. We pray for Christ's church. Make our hearts respond to your love, Lord. Receive our praise and, and hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. We pray for Nanus Bay, Nanaimo, Parksville, Qualicum Beach, Duncan, Ladysmith, Port Alberni, Uculet. Tofino, Comox Valley, Camel River, Lord, all the region of Oceanside, Lord, this island, Father. We pray that you would grant to us, your servants, to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world. Lord, receive our praise and, and hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Lord, we pray especially for all those who are grieving throughout North America right now, especially uh, the people of color. Lord, as all of this is, is, is coming out and being exposed and being shown throughout the world, it's traumatizing to see it all. I'm traumatized seeing it, and I've, I haven't nearly experienced anything like it. Lord, be with them as they grieve, as they call out for justice, as they cry out for safety, as they mourn all those that have been lost, but also as they mourn uh, their, the dehumanization that they've experienced, the violence, the fear, the shame, so much undeserved. And so, Lord, we remember especially Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and their families and their friends. And, Lord, all the unnamed people in our own nation who have suffered these types of injustices, Lord, we remember especially the Indigenous and First Nations communities. 
the grief for all that they've been through, all that they have lost. Lord, somehow lead us into miraculous reparation. Unite the peoples of the world in your kingdom. Lord, restore the lost and the broken. And so, Lord, we ask for the rest of us, for all of us, that you would make our wills eager to obey and our hands ready to heal. Lord, receive our praise and hear yeah. our prayers. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, a couple announcements before we end our service today. Thank you for your prayers last week. Um, we met as council uh, this past Tuesday. And can I just say what a wonderful council we have. Um, just so much unity um, and closeness of heart and a desire to follow the Holy Spirit as Jesus leads our church and asking good, hard questions at time um, and challenging what we're doing to make sure that what we're doing is the right thing to be doing humbly. And so, um, so the decisions that we've come to this past week um, after gathering all sorts of information uh, from the BC government, from the Anglican Network in Canada, uh, from the New Place Community Center, um, and from many of you, um, we prayerfully discussed our options. And what we've decided is to put in place a plan for this summer. And so the summer plan is to continue online services uh, and to continue to move forward in the house church model. So what we'll keep doing is we'll keep providing the services, but we strongly encourage you to find people to gather with. And if you, if you haven't been invited by someone else, it might be because we're all waiting to be invited by someone else. <laughs> so you step out, ask someone to join you. And if, if they're not willing to come to you, you can say, can I come to you? Uh, but let's, Let's, let's take action together mm -hmm. to value being together because I think we all are feeling that disconnect. Yeah. And so it's really important to make that a priority to find ways to be together. Mm -hmm. And then I think if you feel like you're finding your feet in that and there's space and a plan, to start inviting your neighbors to that. Uh, to invite people next door or a friend from work or whatever to say, you can come and join us this Sunday and come receive the way of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll continue our online services. We'll continue to pursue uh, expressing uh, community and house churches. And then what we want to add for the summer is that we would like to do backyard gatherings like we did a few years back, where we would gather together, uh, all of us, in a big backyard, practicing social distancing for times of worship and for testimony and fellowship. Mm -hmm. I just think we all need that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and we'll try and do that while managing kids as best, you know, so we're gonna, we're gonna take the necessary precautions. Your safety is of the utmost priority. Mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna be working on plans to do that. But twice a month, we wanna do the backyard gatherings for worship. And one of those two gatherings a month we will use for a time for communion. Mm -hmm. And and so we're going to do a, a, a communion in COVID kind of plan. What it will probably look like is we'll have the table set up and we will, we will go through uh, the Eucharist together. And then what we'll do is we'll set out on the table an individual cup and an individual wafer, at which one at a time you'll come and take your cup and your wafer. And once they're all gone, we'll wipe the table and we'll set it up again. The next group will come receive the cup and the wafer. 
um, and receive of communion. It's not ideal, but at least we're doing it. We're doing it. Um, and so that's the summer plan, okay? We'll continue online. Our online services will be actually a bit of a shorter version through the summer. Um, we will continue to pursue house churches. We will do backyard gatherings twice a month. And once a month out of those backyard gatherings, we will celebrate communion together. And then come sept September, we will reassess the situation and see how we can uh, uh, move forward from there. Okay? So we, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> it are makes you sense. Not, are you sure? Yeah. First uh, time I heard it, so that was good. Um, and <laughs> so um, I don't want service to go too long today. So let me close now with the blessing um, and the Great Commission. So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Love you all so much. Have a great week.